Welcome to the Conkey Ride Home for Friday, March 11th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, Abraham Lincoln was a telegraph power user, and the 1,000 telegrams he sent during his presidency might have helped the U.S. win the Civil War. Plus, an app that can diagnose rare diseases just by scanning a child's face. And 10,000 people in New Orleans were without power for hours yesterday due to a surprising, but it turns out not uncommon, cause. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. As regular listeners will have picked up on, I am fascinated by attempts to understand our current relationship with technology by comparing and contrasting it with other major shifts in technology throughout history. Now, we can't find exact answers by looking back at history, of course, but sometimes it can challenge us in new ways, or even just provide solace that some of the more concerning human behavior we're seeing in response to this specific technological shift is not necessarily a reflection of us as human beings uniquely unhinged now as compared to previous eras. You know, it can be really eye-opening to see how similar responses to new technologies often have been throughout time. Even without needing to draw comparisons to the internet or social media or what have you, historians are constantly pointing out the huge shifts that happened in the world off the back of the printing press. The accessibility of the written word, the increase in literate people across social classes, it was the tool that enabled Martin Luther to really have a far-reaching impact, spawning the Protestant Reformation. It was a huge deal. And, of course, since it led to the masses having such hitherto unprecedented access to information and knowledge, the ruling classes felt super threatened. I was listening this morning to an interview with Hank Green on John Favreau's Offline podcast, and he threw out this detail I hadn't quite heard before. When the Catholic Church was trying to fight back against Martin Luther's claims, they always responded in Latin, because that was the language of the church. But no one else really spoke Latin, so no one could read what they were publishing, especially the exact people they were most trying to reach, the ones who were reading what Luther was writing in language they could understand. Green compared this to government agencies now having to stick to such stilted, punitively bias-free language that ends up meaning nothing to so many people, whereas podcasters and folks with big platforms who already seem more relatable are sharing information in a way that makes sense to more people. So of course you're going to have people trusting someone who looks like them and who they've followed online for years, even if that person is not an expert and might be spreading some really misleading information, more so than they would listen to a government agency who has not figured out how to communicate in this era. But when governments do learn to adopt new communicative technology, it can have big impacts. Like when President Abraham Lincoln used the telegraph to his advantage during the Civil War. The telegraph was relatively new when the war began in 1861. The first successful message had been sent by Samuel Morse in 1844, and by the start of the 60s was being widely used by the public. But the U.S. government was slow to adopt. In a piece in History.com, shared as a quick link yesterday by Jason on Kotke.org, Christopher Klein points out that government employees at the White House who wanted to send a telegram still had to go to the public telegraph office in the middle of the city. But once the war broke out, it quickly became clear that instantaneous dispatches from the front lines would be crucial. So the military deployed a telegraph corps to lay down over 15,000 miles of telegraph wire across battlefields. And by 1862, there was a new official telegraph office for the War Department right next door to the White House. And Lincoln was a huge fan. According to Klein, Lincoln would read through a stack of new telegrams every morning, and during key battles, he would even sleep on a cot in the telegraph office so he didn't miss any crucial, as he called them, lightning messages, which I love and wish had caught on. Lincoln was slow to sending his own telegrams at first, but as the war intensified, he began sending out a flurry of messages, culminating in over a thousand telegrams written by Lincoln during his presidency. Quoting Klein, The telegraph allowed the president to act as a true commander-in-chief, by issuing commands to his generals and directing the movement of forces in nearly real time. For the first time, a national leader could have virtual battlefront conversations with his military officers. The paucity of interstate telegraph lines in the South precluded Confederate President Jefferson Davis from doing the same. 
Lincoln wasn't shy about stepping in and asserting his thoughts on telegrams that weren't even addressed to him. The telegraph was both his big ear to eavesdrop on what was going on in the field, and his long arm for projecting his leadership, now informed by the newly garnered information, writes Tom Wheeler in Mr. Lincoln's T-Mails, How Abraham Lincoln Used the Telegraph to Win the Civil War. End quote. In addition to the combative and groundbreaking edge it gave him over the Confederate Army, Klein points to other ways that it makes sense that Lincoln would become an enthusiastic power user of the telegraph. For one, he was a mechanically-minded thinker. Having grown up on a farm, he was endlessly fascinated by how different tools and instruments worked, often going off and examining them when he stayed over at other people's farms while on the road. And to this day, he is the only U.S. president to hold a patent for a device for lifting boats over shoals. It was never manufactured, but shows his inventive sense nonetheless. And additionally, Lincoln befriended all of the telegraph operators. He told one of them that the office was his escape. Like most presidents, he was constantly besieged by requests and detractors, not to mention the many tragedies of his family life while in office. Though dispatching official battle plans was serious business, he found a refuge and camaraderie in the telegraph office. You know, telegrams have always fascinated me because they feel like such obvious analogs to texts and tweets. We know from recent experience that we wouldn't feel quite as kindly today to a sitting president sending out thousands of bite-sized missives during a national crisis, although I suppose there is a difference between public declarations on Twitter and private correspondences from a commander-in-chief to his troops. The bigger picture, I guess, is how some technologies step in and really do rock our world. Those who are in the right place with the right idea and the right circumstances to adopt the technology early on can often not only shape the technology itself, but leave lasting marks on the world, bolstered by the unprecedented reach this new technology enables them. Whether it's Martin Luther taking on the Catholic Church, Abraham Lincoln leading the U.S. to victory in the Civil War, or the yet-to-be-determined impacts of the changing ways we're getting our information today. Diagnosing rare diseases can be exceptionally difficult. They don't all so easily present themselves in blood tests or brain scans or even chromosomal analysis. And for the people with the rare diseases, being able to put a name to their experiences can be incredibly validating and also give them and their medical team a roadmap for treatment. And for kids, it can be even more crucial in some cases to identify the cause early on. For a fair number of diseases, they can affect a person's physical attributes, especially their face. So after a conversation with the head of a medical genetics center, serial entrepreneur Modi Snyberg founded a new startup called FDNA and an accompanying app called Face2Gene. The app uses a machine learning algorithm to analyze a patient's face and suggest possible genetic disorders. Snyberg was uniquely suited for this endeavor, having developed a number of recognition technologies in the past, most notably selling his face recognition startup to Facebook in 2012. Quoting Wired, Face 2 Gene is now used by thousands of geneticists worldwide. Its core algorithm can recognize about 300 disorders with high accuracy from a patient's face. That's a boon to geneticists and families searching for a diagnosis. But the face algorithm still can't see most genetic conditions. For the rarest, FDNA doesn't have the seven or more photos from different patients needed to train its algorithm to detect the disorder. Last month, scientists from FDNA and several international institutions published results from a new algorithm called Gestalt Matcher, which they say can distinguish about a thousand conditions, a roughly three-fold increase from FDNA's original algorithm, and it's now available in the Face2Gene app. A refined version of the algorithm for rarer cases was added to the Face2Gene app last month. It can be used to create charts in which faces with the same disorder are clustered together. Clusters for similar conditions appear close to one another. In tests, the new algorithm was less powerful than the Face2Gene's original system at differentiating the 300 more common conditions, but consistently able to separate the roughly 800 more disorders that the service previously couldn't identify. End quote. With tweaks and collaborations, the app is having real-world results. Wired gives the example of two boys from unrelated families in different countries that were both working with doctors to find the answer for the boys' growth problems, tremors, and triangular-shaped faces. 
A site called Gene Matcher originally paired up the two, inferring that they had the same rare mutation, but not able to provide more evidence. So researchers turned to some conventional biology research and then used an experimental algorithm from researchers who had been collaborating with FDNA. The algorithm was able to back up findings from the biology research. So in the lab, it was found that the boys' mutation had a similar effect on their cells to progeria, a genetic disorder in which patients have similarly shaped faces to the boys. The algorithm, however, was able to say that while they have similarly shaped faces to children with progeria, the boys' mutation was distinct from those children and was able to establish theirs as something new. And while that hasn't yet led to answers around a treatment plan, it's a huge step towards further research that could. A facial recognition app, of course, can't work for any or maybe even most diseases, but for very rare ones that present with unique facial characteristics, it can help sift through the weeds and back up other findings. Kind of like how a doctor may be able to look at two patients and their list of symptoms and infer that they share a particular condition, but a more concrete blood test, for example, could confirm it. And while the term facial recognition can cause alarm sometimes in many people because of fears of it being deployed non-consensually by by government bodies or corporations, it remains a technology that, when used responsibly, is one more tool in our belts for better understanding and treating so many things, including rare diseases. Ten thousand people in New Orleans were without power Wednesday morning, some for a few hours, as most power was restored just after 12 p.m. The outage was mostly in the downtown area, and AV Club notes that the Pelicans and Orlando Magic game almost had to be postponed, with the Smoothie King Center losing power for several hours ahead of the game. When you hear about a place like New Orleans losing power, you tend to think of it as weather-related, you know, a bad storm, maybe even a hurricane. But locals weren't entirely surprised by the real culprit yesterday. A bird. A simple bird of unknown type somehow damaged an electrical substation that services customers throughout parts of downtown and uptown New Orleans. And this is apparently not too uncommon of a thing. Quoting the New York Times, about 7,000 Entergy customers lost electricity last summer because of what the utility said was a similar incursion. The occurrence is not unique to New Orleans. Squirrels, monkeys, and even iguanas have caused power failures in other parts of the country and the world. Estimating that 20% of power failures in New Orleans were caused by animals, Entergy said last year that it was testing lasers to keep birds away from its electrical transmission equipment, end quote. Further, in a situation that reminds me a little of Texas's staunch independent grid system recently leading to more and more problems, New Orleans's utilities are apparently regulated by the city council, not by the state like they are in the rest of Louisiana. Now, I don't know if that setup is to blame in particular, but Eric Smith, a business professor at Tulane and associate director of the Tulane Energy Institute, told the Times that they do tend to have, quote, probably a higher rate of outages than some other comparable urban areas, end quote. And folks online were skeptical about how many animals are really causing these outages, with one Twitter user joking that the power grid must be coated in peanut butter. Entergy will be appearing at an upcoming city council meeting to discuss the power outage, but meanwhile, to any birds listening, watch out for substations and laser beams when you're flying through New Orleans. So following on my follow-up yesterday about the U.S. considering a central bank digital currency, or CBDC, I want to share a great newsletter post that I stumbled on yesterday from writer and analyst N.S. Lyons. Lyons takes a strong anti-CBDC stance because of the potential for CBDCs to lead to a totalitarian nightmare, which I did briefly touch on yesterday, at least in terms of surveillance. The second part of the post when he outlines all of that is really great, but I especially loved this little dystopian fiction piece that he led with. Here's just a teaser of it, quote, You awake to find that today is special. It's stimmy day. When you roll over and check your phone, you see a notification from your Fed wallet app letting you know that another $2,000 in Fed coins has just been added directly to your account by the U.S. Federal Reserve. 
To be honest, part of you would love to save that money for the long term, given that things have been getting rather uncertain, what with the war and the economy and all, but you can't since these Fed coins are coded as usable for consumer purchases only and will expire and vanish in seven days. So you better spend them while you've got them. The latest play box it is then. Everyone says Elden Ring 3 is the hottest VR game on the metaverse right now. And then later on, when this character is trying to fill up their old SUV at the gas station, quote, You wave your phone at the pump. Nothing happens. You try again. Your phone buzzes and you look at it. There's a message from the Fed. You have already spent more than the $400 maximum weekly limit on fossil fuels specified in the Fed Wallet User Agreement. Your remaining account balance cannot be used to purchase non-renewable energy resources. Please make an alternative purchase. Have you considered a clean, affordable, new energy vehicle? Thank you for doing your part to build a more just and sustainable world." End quote. And it goes on from there. It's pretty great and horrifying. Link in the show notes if you want to read the whole thing. But that is it from me for this week. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.